Human rights law is for many law schools and it's something which is prescriptive. We tell them what the law is and that's it. They absorb it and they go home. The program from which I transitioned from Chicago here um, was a teaching program. So it's the normal lecture structure that we had. When I got here um, to Fairhaven College and we don't have lectures. So I had to sort of blend those approaches and find ways of incorporating student voices gradually. It was not abrupt, because if it was abrupt, it, it would be total failure. But in an environment like this, it's not enough to simply tell them what the law is. It's also necessary to ask what they think, because part of what we do in the college is to ensure that people are able to critique the law or critique whatever we tell them, so that it's not like they absorb them like, like a sponge and just go up and squeeze it and it's dry. And sometimes, they, once you squeeze it out, it doesn't come back to them. What they engage with in terms of conversations most likely stays with them. That's how I began to structure the classes in such a way as to incorporate the voices more and more. Then I started using questions. And they are in the spectrum of from people who can talk a lot to people who cannot talk at all. So the question is how to move those extremes back to the middle. So that's one of the things I try to do with classes. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But it's necessary that in terms of human rights and the law, people understand that it's not just for them to listen to it, it's something they can think about and engage with because tomorrow we expect them to be active agents of change. And if we don't have those kind of conversations at this point, the change they are looking for or they are trying to implement may not necessarily be the change that is necessary. That's one of the reasons why I decided in the environment in which I was working that it was necessary to keep hearing more from students rather than being the one speaking to them all the time. The preparation part is, I mean, for some people it's easy, for some people it's not. So, particularly for me, it's not very easy because personally, like I tell the students sometimes, I, I'm a very introverted person and so trying to then draw other people to, converse, to a conversation is very difficult for me. One of the things I've tried to do over time, which I learned was, one, when the students read, I want to understand whether or not they understand what they read. How do I do that? I ask them to provide reflections on the reading, so that's a conversation starter. So when they get to class, we can talk about what those reflections are they provided. Then I also provide questions in class to guide and structure the classes so that when we approach the issues, we take it step by step and we I don't introduce the biggest concepts at the beginning, so we start from the small concepts and then move on. So by the time they get to the bigger concepts, it's easier to relate to and it's not as intimidating as if they started with that. Because many times it's like, some people are not very sure of what they read. They read it, they understood it, but they are not sure that that understanding they have is the correct one. Having those set of questions which are very, very basic helps them to, okay, I understand that one. I understand the next one, I understand the next one. So when we get to the bigger one, I don't think it's as difficult as they would think it is. So that kind of structure helps over time. And for most of my classes, I retain the same structure. So everybody coming to the class, who's been in the previous class, knows what they're coming into. Then, even if it's the first time in the class, once they see the structure, they know exactly this is what they're expecting for the rest of the 10 weeks. Of course, we tweak it here and there, for instance, sometimes I introduce debates in class where people stand on different sides and it's not their choice, I assign them. If you only argue what you believe, then what's the point of it? You're already affirming what you know. So engaging with other views is necessary. Coming from Chicago to Bellingham, 
the cultures, are, at least as somebody who came from outside the United States, I see differences in those three states. Bringing that essentially into the work here and into the discussion is framed by my background as coming from Nigeria, particularly with the background of military dictatorship that we just were coming through because I first got to the U.S. in 1999 and there was a return to democracy after about 16 years. And those 16 years were particularly brutal. I was teaching then as well. The element of military dictatorship and its impact on academic work, you know, sometimes operated in the back of the mind about how to appreciate the work that one is doing. And living through that dictatorship, I mean, I'm not the one who suffered the most, I'm not ever claiming that, but I have family who, who had to go into exile, who suffered loss and things like that. And, and yet I was teaching human rights in that particular environment. So bringing that here meant that, you know, one, one had to understand what was going on in this environment. And the element of the international, you sort of blend it with the domestic. With my own background, uh, I needed to not only use that to challenge the understanding that people have here about what the world is. Sometimes the world they envision or they look at or think of is different from the world that exists. How do we then ensure that when we study human rights, that it's something that's approximate or close to the reality, not the human rights we are imagining. That background and being an African and coming to teach in this predominantly non-African environment meant that I can bring my own understanding and blend it with the understanding that people here have to enrich the discussion and ensure that at least in the world which they live, they understand that there's a different world out there. And the experiences of other people are not necessarily theirs and what they think are problems are not necessarily problems for other people. Or it may be problems for other people, but not on the same degree, on the same scale. I have students in class who come and say, I thought I had problems. When they see the scale of inhumanity that exists, they appreciate that. They are very, very privileged to be where they are. I don't try to push who I am, it's obvious, but I also need them to understand that I'm not an object of pity. I'm not somebody you should, you should feel sorry for. And we are just trying to do this thing together. So who I am matters, but it also matters who they are and sort of trying to blend those together to arrive at some understanding that is fruitful for them and useful for me because I can use the understanding which I gain from them in subsequent classes because now I, I have some experience with a different culture, different ideas. Then when those ideas, I mean, show up again, it's easy for me to appreciate where they're coming from.